This is Climate One, changing the conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. I'm Greg Dalton. Record percentages of Americans are deeply concerned about global warming, according to a recent Gallup poll. More than 60% say it is caused by humans and is happening now. That concern was on display recently when tens of thousands of people marched on the National Mall calling for strong climate protection. President Trump has called global warming a hoax and filled his cabinet with people who deny or doubt the overwhelming scientific consensus that burning fossil fuels is causing temperatures and seas to rise. Most Republicans in Congress try to stay as far away as possible from this issue. Many Democrats, as well as corporations including IBM, Coca-Cola, Disney, General Electric, and Walmart, say climate is a serious risk to the economy and addressing it will create jobs and wealth. On the show today, we'll explore the politics of carbon pollution in Washington, D.C. and around the country. Later in the show, we'll hear from U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island, who's one of the strongest voices in Congress calling for a move to cleaner energy. First, we'll hear from two activists from the right and the left. What they say may surprise you. May Bouvi is executive director of 350.org, a grassroots organization that mobilizes people around the country and the world get it for getting off fossil fuels. She's a former student of 350.org founder, author, and activist Bill McKibben. Debbie Dooley is president of Conservatives for Energy Freedom, a resident of Atlanta. She formerly served on the board of the Tea Party Patriots and is a co-founder of the Green Tea Coalition. Please welcome them to Climate One. Welcome to you both. Uh, Debbie Dooley, what's your vision for America in an era of global warming? I envision that we remove the regulatory barriers that exist and allow energy to compete on a level playing field in the market. Uh, I fully and truly believe that moving to a decentralized power structure for example, rooftop solar is in our national security interests. So I, you know, I envision tens of millions of rooftop solar installations on homes. Uh, I envision sooner or later Republicans coming to grips with the fact that fossil fuel is damaging our environment. I don't see how they cannot believe that fossil fuel is causing damage to the environment. I see a world where left and right come together and we work together for a green energy revolution that is uh, enveloping our nation as we speak. 75% of Trump supporters like renewables, and they think we should do more to advance renewables. We need to look forward to innovation, to technology, to clean energy, and job creation. Well, if 75% of Trump yep. supporters support renewables, he's going in a different direction, trying to uh, drill off the coast, bring back coal. So is that upsetting to Trump supporters or is it just not a high priority issue for them? It's not a high priority issue for most Trump supporters. And you have to understand a lot of Republicans and conservatives don't like excessive regulation. They believe in competition and in choice. And, and that's something they believe in. They don't believe trying to regulate an industry out of business. But more and more people are embracing renewables. This is quite a change from the end of 2012, the beginning of 2013, when I first became a very strong clean energy advocate. People looked at me like I was from Mars. You're a conservative, you can't like clean energy. But I did. And I, I do think uh, one of the things, I spoke at, spoke at Bloomberg's event, and I t said, made this statement on the record, that I did not believe President Trump was going to pull out of the Paris Accord because it would be bad for business. And I, I mean, the genie's out of the bottle. It's not going to be put back in. I mean, clean energy will continue to flourish. Even conservatives are embracing it. And that was a poll that was taken in November that showed only 25% of Trump supporters believed in climate change, but 75% thought the nation should do more to advance renewables. 
and we'll get into some of that language later. Maybe uh, how does that compare with your vision for uh, your, a very different place politically, but how does what you just heard compare with your vision for energy in America in a hot world? It does seem pretty clear that the belief that renewable energy is what we need, not only in this country but around the world, is shared. More and more every day we're hearing this, that that consensus is getting stronger. And there's just so much evidence that people are seeing their own economic development tied to the transition off of fossil fuels. So I think that is where we have room to build. And I think that belief is uniting people across political divides, across all the divides we see in our movements. So in that sense, I think there's a lot to work from. A lot of our work is focused on how quickly can we accelerate the transition off of fossil fuels. Because what we know about climate change is that it's already happening much faster than anyone expected. Our top scientists are horrified when they look at their own models, they look at the evidence, and they see what's taking place. So our concern is that the fossil fuel interests are standing in the way of that progress, and it's, it's their impact on the political process that we're contending with. So that is why we see people mobilizing in the streets. There are countless mobilizations of people who are trying to move this forward. That's, I think, where the challenge comes, is that we do see a very strong role for government in bringing that transition about, because the scale of change required is so massive that it's hard to imagine doing that without the role of government. And second, one of the things that we really believe in is that this is a movement for everybody. It's got to be a deeply inclusive movement across the lines that have historically divided us on race, on gender, sexual orientation, sexual identity, all the things that make us who we are. We're all part of that movement. And so that's the other place where I think we need to be building something together. And if we can do that, and we can do that through renewable energy, sign me up. David, Julie, you nodded your head when May Bouvie said inclusive. Uh, yeah. The brown economy left a lot of people behind. It affected communities of color who lived closest to the refineries and factories. They breathe the dirtiest air. Do you think the green economy should address some of those people who were hurt in the brown economy? I do. Uh, what I would love to see happen is for a lot of the renewable companies to build factories or plants in West Virginia and Kentucky and put coal miners that are out of work, put them to work in the renewable energy field. And, and this is a field that is growing and it's growing stronger. But yes, I think renewable should be open to everyone. And I do know there are some programs in Kentucky and West Virginia where they're actually, the solar industry is actually training uh, out-of-work coal miners in the solar industry field. And I think that's something that needs to happen. If this makes so much sense and there's jobs, then, then uh, it sounds like there's more action at the state level than the federal level, then why is there this gridlock in, the, in Congress where there's, uh, by one recent count, 180 members of Congress who deny climate change, 142 in the House, 38 in the Senate, they've accepted $82 million from fossil fuel yes. companies. Is that related? <laughs> I think that's very related. And I can tell you from my work in the states under the Obama administration, even though he was very pro-renewables, I was fighting battle after battle after battle on the state level. And a lot of that money what I saw happening is something that's a very dangerous trend as far as I, I'm concerned in renewables is that you saw these fossil fuel companies joining forces with these electric utility monopolies to stop competition from renewables. You have to understand one thing. People say, well, why would these electric utilities do that? They make a guaranteed profit every time they have to build a new power plant. So they want to keep on having to build new power plant. And in Florida, I mean, Koch Brothers funded groups. They're horrible. I don't like, you know, I'm not fond of Koch Brothers or their groups in any way because I've had experience with them actually lying outright lying and distorting the facts. And some of the very same people 
that are these groups like Heartland and Competitive Enterprise Institute that are saying man is not damaging the environment and renewables are bad. In the 1990s, these same groups were taking money from big tobacco to convince Americans secondhand smoke posed no health risk. If they lied to us once, why should we believe anything they say? May Boovey, are you having a little bit of an out-of-body experience hearing uh, a, a co-founder of the Tea Party talking like this? I'd like to you know, have your response. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear you say this because I think one of the biggest challenges we face is the fossil fuel sector's political power. Yeah. And you know, for our own organization, we're fighting a battle with Exxon right now. They have been lying about climate change for so long, and new research, new research has revealed that their own scientists actually knew about climate change many, many years ago, and then they continued to fund organizations that pretended that climate change science was unresolved. And so attorneys general from Massachusetts, New York, some other states have started to investigate what did Exxon know, when did they know it? And we joined forces to try to amplify that campaign, and we were, uh, thanked by receiving a subpoena so from Exxon. So this battle is very serious, and it's often portrayed on partisan lines, but there is enormous public support for holding the fossil fuel industry to account. And uh, what's the best way to, to do that, to hold them to account, do you think? In many ways, it's to pass these kinds of policies, ideally at the federal level, but we don't see we have a lot of possibility for that right now, but at the state and local level, really demonstrating that the alternative is here. It's also through stopping pipelines and coal plants, stopping the Keystone XL, the Dakota Access Pipeline. We need to demonstrate to this industry that people are moving forward. We don't want their product anymore. People are divesting institutions. Harvard just moved a lot of its assets out of fossil fuels this week. So that is how we show that this is different. This is a different time. Debbie Dooley, do you think divestment's a good idea? Taking I, your money I away do, from I do. And one of the things you have to look at is uh, when you mentioned gas pipelines, um, there was a pipeline that a company wanted to go put through South Georgia. Well, the farmers in South Georgia got together, Republicans, and they turned to Republicans in the Georgia legislature, and they made it a private property right and stopped that pipeline. And there was legislation that actually passed the Georgia legislature that made it more difficult for them. I think one of the things you have to look at and be careful is when you go after an industry uh, with Republicans, a lot of times they will become more sympathetic for that industry. I think the lawsuit is very good, and I will point to the big tobacco lawsuit in the 1990s. Had it not been for, for all these attorney generals of these different states, uh, you know, suing big tobacco, you know, we would have never, the, they would have kept denying it for decades and they would still be denying that smoke posed a health risk. So I think what they're doing is very good. And one of the things that we definitely need to do is just like, I'm from the South. And, one of the things that my mom used to say said that, be careful when you go in the kitchen because when you turn the light on, the roaches scatter. So a, a lot of times I, I think you have to shine the light and start calling them out. Hey, you're receiving money from this oil company, uh, from fossil fuel or from Koch brothers or from these monopolies. So of course you're doing that. You're being paid to take that position and shining the light of day, just like they're doing with the lawsuit. I'm Greg Dalton, and this is Climate One, a project of the Commonwealth Club of California. We'll be back in a moment with May Boovey and Debbie Dooley, and I'm going to go now talk with U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Great to be, thank you for being here. Good to be with you. So, I don't dare move from my mark, so you got to reach for me. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just heard from a co-founder of the Tea Party and 350.org, one of the most uh, organized environmental organizations. Were you a little surprised by what you just heard, the far left and far right talking? Well, you know, it goes all the way back to the Sierra Club and the Tea Party in Atlanta, successfully beating back the big utilities who were trying to get taxes to their benefit for solar on the roofs of homes. 
And uh, Sierra Club folks were against that because it was not in the interests of a clean environment. And the Tea Party people were against that because they didn't want to have stuff on their homes taxed. And they made the original Green Tea Coalition. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that should prevent 350.org and the Tea Party from getting together because there is nothing in Tea Party doctrine that says we're really happy when a big industry can take over our United States government and run it for its own benefit, paying no attention to the wishes or the welfare of the people. That's not in anybody's interest except the industry in question. So we see uh, the left and the right getting together in Georgia and, and other places. How about uh, at, at your workplace? Is that happening uh, in the US Senate? Because uh, 10 years ago, Barack Obama and John McCain were basically in the same place yeah. on climate change when they both ran for president. Now things are further apart. I got elected in 2006. I was sworn in in 2007. For all of 2007, 2008, and 2009, while I was in the Senate, there were multiple bipartisan climate change bills to regulate the emissions of carbon dioxide. And in that period, the Republican candidate for president, you mentioned John McCain, ran, carried his party's banner into that presidential election on a great climate change platform. Then came January of 2010. And in January of 2010, five justices on the Supreme Court gave the fossil fuel industry and other big industries the biggest prize that has ever been given out in American politics, which is the ability to spend unlimited amounts of money in politics. You mentioned the 80 some million dollars that has gone to members of Congress. That is the tiniest tip of the iceberg. The big thing in Congress is the ability to spend unlimited money. And with that comes the ability to threaten to spend unlimited money. So what the fossil fuel industry has done is gone to the Republican Party, they've picked their target, and they've said, anybody who crosses us on climate change, we will take you out. Mm -hmm. And they have a credible threat, uh, as demonstrated by a Republican congressman named Bob Inglis, who they, in fact, took out. So when you've got an industry saying, we have the ability to spend unlimited amounts of money to crush you, and we will do so if you dare cross us, that's much worse than $80 million in reported money that's floating around. That's not good, but that's not as bad as the threats. A lot of town halls recently, Republicans have been challenged on climate change publicly in a way that they haven't been recently. Do you think that will cause some movement? Uh, Daryl Issa is a very conservative member of Congress from San Diego. Yep. He recently joined a caucus in Congress, the Climate Solutions Caucus. He lost a, he won a very competitive race. Uh, do you think that that public pressure in these town halls is moving any of the members? Public pressure is moving them, but so is the pressure of facts around them. Uh, Representative Crabello represents the Keys down in Florida. He's a Republican. If you live in the Keys down in Florida, you are having a harder and harder time finding fresh water. As the sea encroaches, it pushes counter pressure against the underlying fresh water, and it makes it hard to find. If you live in the Keys, you're looking at foreseeable circumstances not too far from now when your house is going to be underwater. You have the Republican mayor of that county planning for these near catastrophic eventualities. So if you're going to represent that district, you can't pretend this is not real. Everybody knows you're lying. So that pressure is also working on some members of Congress who are Republican. But it's easy to talk a cheap talk and sign on to a resolution that says, I'm a Republican and I think we should do something. Mm -hmm. None of them yet have crossed the Rubicon to say, here's a bill I'll actually support that is meaningful in addressing climate change. Senator Sanders and another senator recently introduced a bill for 100% renewable power in, in America. That's really regulated at the state level. We just heard from Debbie Dooley, Green Tea Party, saying that she sees that moving forward. Is that something that uh, there was no Republican co-sponsors of that bill? Yeah. Any chances of that going anywhere? I, I doubt it. If you look at the Republicans outside of Congress who aren't under the same political pressure from the fossil fuel industry because they don't have an election upcoming in which unlimited money can be spent against them, Virtually every Republican who has looked at climate change and thought it through to a solution has come to the same solution. And that solution is a price on carbon that makes the market work and that is revenue neutral, meaning you don't grow government with it. You take all the revenue that it raises and you push it back to the public. And I think on the Democratic side, our answer to that is yes, we will be happily go there. But I think the best place to target a solution is where 
virtually every Republican points right now. Right, and British Columbia has done that. Uh, former, two former uh, Republican Secretary of the Treasury, uh, uh, James Baker, yeah, George Baker, Schultz, Schultz, and Paulson, and Paulson came to Washington, presented a plan. Uh, is that a little bit like Grandpa coming to town? You have to give them some respect, but don't have to do what they say. Well, until they have unlimited money to spend, and they can say to a Republican senator, "Hey." I know those fossil fuel guys are going to come after you, but I promise you I'm well resourced too and I will have your back. That's the conversation that will break this gridlock and that's the conversation that is not yet happening. You look at good companies, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Google, Walmart, Unilever, you can go through a whole list of companies in America that have terrific climate policies. They don't lift a collective finger in Congress. They have given up on Congress and they have given the fossil fuel industry free reign to bully and terrorize around the building. Nobody pushes back. It's really embarrassing for America's corporate leadership. And have you asked them, why don't you weigh in on climate? Because they certainly tell their customers they're, they're on that side. They say they're scared. The, oh. dis the, 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 the confluence between fossil fuel interests and the Republican Party in Congress has gotten so great that they don't know where the boundary is any longer. And if you're Apple, you're worried about hiding your revenues offshore in Ireland, and you don't want Speaker Ryan to come after you on your offshore revenues, you want to be left alone on that, so you say virtually nothing in Congress about climate change. And if you're Coca-Cola, you have issues making sure there's never going to be a soda tax, so you say nothing about climate change in Congress, even though your website's terrific, your policies are terrific, and you're even trying to influence your own supply chain. So if you put a sign up over Congress that said, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, that is what corporate America sees. And I guess my message today would be, you shouldn't think that way. You know, there's safety in numbers. And the group of big American corporations that came together to support President Obama in Paris made a difference. They could make the same difference if they'd get together and come to Washington and say to Republicans, we will have your back. We know what the bad guys are going to do. We will have your back. John McCain is a hell of a brave man. He does not need to know that he's going to win before he'll get into a fight. But he doesn't sign up for suicide missions either. Our thanks to, uh, Republic, to Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for, to Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. We're back with Debbie Dooley and May Boovey at Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. I'd like to uh, ask a little bit about May Boovey. Coming here today, were you a little bit reluctant, anxious about sitting down with a Tea Party person? Not sure what you're going to get? Yeah, I was. And I think what we're trying to grapple with right now is, and we haven't talked a whole lot about Donald Trump yet in this conversation, and we cannot underscore the devastating impact that he's having in this country. And so that's what worried me, is that I think he has so torn apart the fabric of our democracy, and I think so many people are afraid for their future in this country because of his presidency, people who are refugees seeking shelter, people who are immigrants living in this country, women who have lost access to rep reproductive care. And so this is our movement. You know, climate change is not uh, an issue per se. It's something that affects us all. And so in thinking about this conversation and places where I know there are divisions, um, I'm interested in thinking about how do we actually talk about those, those places where there is not agreement? Because fortunately, Mother Nature is doing the job for us in terms of convincing people about climate change. And the economy is doing our job for us when it comes to renewables. But what about the rest of us? What about uh, rebuilding our democracy? We're going to hear from some people who are at the climate march today, at the, uh, the People's Climate March, drew tens of thousands of people uh, into the streets uh, just following the March for Science the week before. Here's what people had to say. Hi, my name is Melanie Koba. We came with our kids. Obviously, the climate is the future, so we wanted to set a good example for this, my niece and my daughter. I live on New River in Fort Lauderdale, which is downtown uh, Fort Lauderdale, and we have now, in full moons, the river flows over and overflows my street right in front of me. I live, you know, two miles from the beach, so rising sea levels compromise our economy, tourism, 
because yeah, a couple of inches of water will devastate our home. I'm Terry from Michigan. And basically, I feel like this is my calling to action. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going into something involving the earth and the climate and preserving it. So I feel like this is my nature. Like I need to be here. This is my calling. This is like the reason why I'm here. And I'm Sir Frazier, and I'm also here with Philly Throbs. And Philly Throbs is actually working on trying to get the oil refinery out of South Philly. And we're here to show that climate change is real and that it affects a lot of people. Because I know I myself got asthma and this area is really hurting myself. My name is Kalila Barnett. So I work with an environmental justice organization in Boston and we are here because we believe that there needs to be a just transition away from the fossil fuel economy. We think that um, working for climate justice is not separate from the social justice movement, that they're really integrated. And so we want our communities to be able to have access to healthy air, healthy water, um, to drink, but we also want people to have jobs and relationships to the economy and to each other that are healthy and sustainable. Voices from the People's Climate March in Washington, D.C. Debbie Dooley, I'd like to have your thoughts on that march, the people you saw, what they were saying out there. I saw a, a big diversity of signs that were out there. My favorite one talked about was the one that I had showed you. It talked about uh, clean energy equals jobs. And that's something that we could focus on. And I enjoyed listening to uh, the senator. Uh, and I will validate what he said. I have had a lot of Republican elected officials tell me privately we, I support what you're doing, but if I speak out, I know I'm going to be attacked, so I want people to defend me, you know, from the Republican side. And he's absolutely right. Uh, we have some Republicans that are stepping out on behalf of renewables, but they're not seeing any of the, you know, campaign contributions or anything like that, like he, he was talking about. Uh, I do, uh, you know, I always encourage, it was a peaceful march. There were a lot of folks there. I would just came in later this afternoon after it was almost over. And, uh, you know, it, it was a lot of diverse crowd. Uh, you know, and I'll have to disagree about Donald Trump because I, you know, have, I don't agree with a lot of stuff that he says, especially, you know, renewables and climate change, but I do think he can be convinced uh, to promote renewables based on innovation, based on job creation. In Governor Rick Perry's state of Texas, there are 100,000 people employed in the renewable energy field in Texas under Rick Perry. So, and, and that's something, uh, you know, that I would look at. And, you know, I put together, he, he mentioned my work with Green Tea Coalition in Atlanta. I've worked with Sierra Club. I've worked with Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Uh, in Florida, we put together a coalition that included Tea Party activists, Christian Coalition, uh, Sierra Club, environmental groups, uh, Republican Liberty Caucus, coming together. For me, this earth is not a Republican earth or a Democrat earth. It's not a conservative or liberal earth. So we may disagree on 85% of the issues, but we owe it to future generations of the world, to our great grandchildren and grandchildren to work together to protect this earth and to lead when it comes to renewables. The United States should not let China lead when it comes to renewables. We should be the ones out there leading. This is Climate One. Debbie Dooley is a co-founder of the Tea Party Movement and founder of the Green Tea Coalition. Also here with May Boovey, executive director of 350.org. I'm Greg Dalton. Greg Wortham is the former mayor of Sweetwater, Texas, is a big proponent of wind energy. He says wind could be the economic engine that revitalizes the Great Plains. My name is Greg Wortham. I'm the executive director and founder of the Texas Wind Energy Clearinghouse, and I was the mayor of Sweetwater, Texas. Uh, from 2007 to 2014. We're the greenest place on the planet. I got 3,000 megawatts of wind in my town. There's no community like the Sweetwater area that creates as much megawatts of green energy as we do. 
It's ranchers and farmers who are used to using their land for energy. They've been caring for the same land for families for 100 plus years. And the landowners know how to use their land efficiently for wind and solar and oil and natural gas and cattle and agriculture and crops. There's more landowners who want it than can fit into the grid. We have so many new schools, I mean, unlimited new schools in Kansas that would have been closed if wind had come along. I'm one of these people who wants red, white, and blue solutions, not red solutions or blue solutions. That's why we got all the chaos we've got, is that people feel like they have to pick a side. I have to be for oil, so I can't be for wind. I have to be for wind, so I can't be for oil. And that's not getting us anywhere. Wind region is up and down the Great Plains. So if you look at it on an electoral map, it's red. 75% of all wind products are in Republican congressional districts. And so we're getting it done at met levels that nobody else is getting it done by not sort of having parades about it. If we make a big stink about it or, you know, march about it, the handful of people who could block in the legislature will say, wait a minute, I'm told I don't like that. I should create an, an opposition to that. I should create a bill. We'll stop it. Maybe we, your comments there that sometimes making a big, big deal about something makes it hard for people to accept it. That, is there some truth to that? Well, we've definitely taken the opposing tack <laughs> 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 to try to make the biggest possible deal we can about the climate crisis so as to build a movement. And I do hear this in some situations and in some cities and states where people are trying to work that actually they've gotten a lot done by doing it rather quietly. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we hear this about our, our colleagues working in Brazil, actually, where the national government is in a bit of disarray, but locally a lot is happening to stop fracking. So there are examples where this is true, but our fundamental belief is that we actually do need to build political power in order to tackle this issue at scale. I think that's... That's the place I want to come back to, is that we don't have a lot of time to see the shift take place. And I think if we just kind of waited for everyone to, to come around on renewable energy, it might not happen fast enough. And we're already seeing such devastating impacts of climate change here and around the world. We're talking on a day that is one of the hottest April days on record. Um, and while it's 97 degrees in Washington, D.C., it's 126 degrees in parts of Pakistan. People are already living through conditions that are only going to make their lives more challenging. And so that is the imperative for the scale. That is why we focus on building the biggest movement that we can. And so I think if we can continue to emphasize that, that's what matters to me. But it's hard to do that if you're quiet about it. And I think reasonable people disagree about the best way to galvanize the public about climate change. There's been lots of opinion polling and research about what is yeah. the message that will motivate people, and it seems that it really depends who you're talking to, but at the end of the day, I mean, we're named after a scientific data point, 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. That says a lot about what we believe, that it's hard to fix a problem that you don't talk about. And even in the early days of the Obama administration, People wanted to solve climate change but not talk about it, which to us at a certain point just didn't make any sense. And we've come a long way from those days, but we're still not powerful enough. Debbie Dooley, I hear that from Republicans. The markets are moving in the right direction. Just be quiet. Give it some time. Technology will solve this. But you talk to scientists, and it's very, very urgent what's happening here. This system could change very quickly. Abrupt climate change can happen. I'd like to hear you address that political power comment that May Booby just said, because the fossil fuel interests, as we heard from Senator Whitehouse, and you know, have a lot of money and a lot of power, and they're not going to go down easy. No, they're not, but I am out there and I'm pretty vocal and a lot of uh, folks are becoming vocal. And for me, I want results. I, I don't want to just talk and, you know, I want to find a way where we can meet in the middle and actually obtain results. Like in Georgia. Georgia is really doing well for solar. But, and we just passed a, a couple of years ago, a PPA bill, which is, uh, you know, sales and leasing of, of solar. And Republicans passed this legislation based on free market principles and choice. Now, it doesn't matter that they didn't believe in climate change, but they're taking action uh, to get us to the point that we want 
to, to be at. And more and more people were winning the hearts and minds of conservatives. And I think there's a lot of things going on. Uh, you know, innovation, when it takes, I mean, when we have, I know a lot of conservatives, including Tea Party activists, that told me as soon as the battery backup is there, they're disconnecting from the grid and they're going solar and renewables. I just think we have to continue to fight. We have to fight on a federal level and on a state level. There is so much damage that can be done uh, you know, a lot of the folks that I witnessed under the Obama administration on a state level, um, I mean, would just completely undermine everything President Obama did on the federal level. And we have to be prepared to fight on a state-by-state -state level. And, you know, and that's something that we need to do. It doesn't matter if they believe in climate change or not, as long as they're working with me side by side to advance renewables. And I think that is going to happen. I think you're going to see it. I can see a big change in the conservatives' uh, movement about renewables. This is Climate One from the Commonwealth Club. I'm Greg Dalton. Our guests today are Debbie Dooley, co-founder of the Tea Party Movement and Green Tea Coalition, and May Boovey, uh, who is uh, the executive director of 350.org. We're going to go to our lightning round and ask you a series of quick questions. Okay. I'm going to ask you, uh, name something, say a phrase, uh, and get your first unfiltered response to that, and then we'll go to true or false. Debbie Dooley, EPA, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt. I'm not real fond of him. <laughs> okay. May Boovey, Energy Secretary Rick Perry. On the wrong side of history. <laughs> May Boovey, Ivanka Trump. Don't believe a word of it. <clears throat> Debbie Dooley, Bears Ears National Monument in Utah. That National Monument in Utah, I have no clue what it is. <laughs> Very controversial. Uh, May Booby, the plan to price carbon pollution from James Baker, George Shultz, two former cabinet members under Presidents Reagan and Nixon. We need the price to be very high to make a difference at this stage of how the renewable energy sector has evolved. Uh, let's go to true or false. Uh, true or false, May Bovee. Overall, the Tea Party has had a negative impact on American politics by pushing the country to the right and denigrating the legitimate role of government. True. Sorry, Debbie. <laughs> um, Debbie Dooley, uh, true or false, Russian interference in the 2016 election casts a cloud over the legitimacy of Donald Trump's presidency. Absolutely false. They didn't make me cast my vote. May Bovee, uh, true, uh, the... True or false, the campaign to block Keystone XL pipeline accomplished very little because oil and money flowed into other projects. False. Uh, <laughs> Debbie Dooley, Citizens United should be repealed because the unfettered spending it allows corrupts our democracy. True. May Boovey, uh, true or false, some coastal environmentalists should spend more time listening and less time preaching. True. Debbie Dooley, true or false, oil drilling should be permanently banned in the, Alar in the Alaska National Wildlife Reserve. False. True or false, more American water should be open to offshore oil drilling. For, for uh, Debbie Dooley. Uh, more uh, I, I'm a native of Louisiana, false. So, okay. Uh, May Boovey, true or false, there is scientific consensus in the United States that eating GMOs is safe for humans. False. One more time. Uh, for May, Boob May Booby, there's a scientific consensus in the United States that eating GMOs is safe for humans. False. According to the American Advancement of, uh, for Association of Science, 89% of scientists say that is true. Um, true or false, Debbie Dooley, Al Gore once called you his friend. That is true. He is my friend. Um, true or false, May Boovey, you like Debbie Dooley more than you thought you would. True. <laughs> <laughs> Last one for Debbie Dooley. Uh, you'd like to have a few mint juleps with May Boovey on the porch and get to know her. I don't know about mint juleps, but something alcoholic, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that ends our lightning round. Let's give them a, a round of thanks for uh, getting through that. <laughs> 
Uh, May Boovey, what's one thing that conservatives should know about you? That I want there to be an honest conversation about what it's going to take to build the kind of inclusive movement that we need and that I'm willing to listen. I really am. And I think we need a level of dialogue that we have lacked. And that's not just true between so-called conservatives and so-called progressives in this country. I think since the election, there's been a lot of positive resistance, but there's also been a lot of division in the country. And I think if we can't take a step back and listen to each other and tell our stories, why do we think what we think? What made us who we are to believe what we believe? If we can't get to that level, we're not possibly going to bridge the kind of divides that we have. So. Uh, people should know I'm always willing to listen, but I, and also that a lot of my extended family is very conservative. Um, a lot of them voted for Donald Trump and don't believe in climate change, and that's very hard for me. And I wrote them an impassioned letter asking them to please, uh, please reconsider because they're they're deeply ethical people, they're deeply moral people, and I I try to focus it on those those terms, but it's because of that personal experience that I have more reservations about the kind of unity we need to build. Debbie Dooley, how do you talk to people who don't acknowledge climate change, the language you use? I talk to them about free market competition, choice, innovation, America needs to lead, uh, that this, is, uh, this technology is the most cost-effective technology, mm. is clean energy. We need to protect clean air and clean water for future generations of Americans. And it's job creation. That, and you point, I point to all the jobs that clean energy employs in this country now. It's a genie that is out of the bottle and it won't go back in. It's way too big for that little bottle for it to go back in. And it, it's something that we need to put aside what you've heard about clean energy because, I mean, let's be honest, conservatives have been brainwashed about clean energy. They've been brainwashed into thinking man's not damaging the environment. So I just put out the facts and show them uh, you know, this is why these, these groups are trying to deceive you is because they're being paid to do that by fossil fuel interest. Debbie Dooley is a co-founder of the Tea Party and the Green Tea <laughs> Coalition. This is Climate One from the Commonwealth Club uh, from Washington, D.C. today. Our other guest is May Boovey, executive director of 350.org. I am Greg Dalton. <laughs> We're going to uh, go to audience questions in just a minute, so if you'd like to line up at the microphone, we'll take your questions, uh, one one-part question uh, as soon. Uh, but first, I want to ask, May Boovey, a lot of movements are built on villainizing, sort of attacking people. Um, do you think we need some more empathy sometimes for people that work in those industries rather than making them bad people, which makes it hard to accept your message? I do think more movements based on empathy is essential. I also think that when the climate movement started to focus on the fossil fuel industry was when we started to win, because I think up until that movement, up until that moment, we were focused on only individual actions that people can take. You know, if you bike more to work, if you compost, if you buy a Prius, not only were these only reaching a certain portion of the population, they were never going to address the problem at the scale that we have to. So when we started acting like a social movement where we there were heroes and real villains. I think we've really demonstrated that's where I think there's a lot of alignment, actually, is the disastrous role the industry is playing. So I think that has been really important. And I think that's different than being unempathetic. I think it's about speaking truth to power and revealing something about our politics that is resulting in catastrophic climate change. This is Climate One from the Commonwealth Club. I'm Greg Dalton. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome. Step on up. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting this today, Climate One. It's been an honor as an audience member. Uh, my question is for Mrs. Dooley, and that is, um, so I'm the uh, Third Coast uh, Regional Coordinator for Citizens Climate Lobby down in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. We do a lot of um, outreach to both sides of the aisle, and I'd love to get you down actually for a keynote uh, 
uh, for our upcoming conference next year. But I'd also love to ask you, how can we do, we, we talk a lot about movement building and reaching out uh, to all of the allies, especially for today's march. How can we do a better job of engaging our conservative allies in marches like this? And how can we engage them to join us in uh, meetings that we have with members of Congress as well? Thank you. I, that is a good question, and one thing you have to understand, you have to be respectful of each other's opinions. And you talk to them with language they understand. Uh, and I did a Vox, VOX.com video, so if you haven't seen it, please look at that. That would be helpful. And a lot of progressives make the mistake of <clears throat> thinking that just because someone, a conservative, denies climate change, they make the mistake of believing, well, they, they don't like renewables. That's not true. So you need to reach out and have that initial conversation. I will be <clears throat> more than happy to facilitate that. If you want to email me at debbie at energyfreedomusa.org, Let's get together on that. Let's go to our next question. Welcome to Climate One. Hi, this is from A. Um, I'm concerned about uniting different groups uh, behind a program that uh, the example in Washington State happened last fall. And our groups that were proponents and progressive thinkers for the climate weren't able to unite, specifically with Citizens Climate Lobby's proposal of a carbon fee and dividend or a refundable carbon fee. What would have to happen to get 350 orgs support behind that bill so that we could be united on that? May Booby. This is a really good example. And for people not familiar, there was, a, in the last election, an effort to pass a price on carbon in the state of Washington summary. And there's lots of similar efforts around the country. I think this is the kind of the heart of the dispute here, is who, who matters in the movement. And I think in Washington, there was a an ongoing yearly effort to try to get a numer numerous sets of groups to align, labor unions, community groups, communities of color, environmental groups. And I think the, some of the concern was that not everybody's voice was heard in that dispute. And I think this, this is where I think people disagree about ends justify the means. However you get there, if you don't agree on everything, you can't work together. People see that differently. And so I think why we do things like the climate march is to get in the habit of working together with, this was an effort of 900 different organizations, right? And so unless we get in the practice of learning how to work together and again, listen empathetically to the concerns, I think that was part of the issue in Washington is that people didn't feel like they understood where it was coming from, they were blindsided, and then suddenly it fell apart. And so I don't have the, I wish I had the recipe, right? If we had the recipe, we'd have the bills that we need. But if I could be more concrete, if you're working in a city right now, you're trying to pass climate policy, just make sure you've got a, a wide and very diverse set of groups at the table who represent all the facets of the climate movement and try to build with that set of people. It's often seen as a very uh, coastal, white, elitist kind of thing. That's May Bouvi, executive director of 350.org. Let's go to our next question. That was my exact question, so I'll change it up a little bit. Thank you both so much. I'm also with Citizens Climate Lobby, and we're very interested in having a bipartisan solution involving carbon pricing. Um, one of the problems is that a lot of people in the environmental groups, and especially left-leaning environmental groups, don't want to acknowledge that for Republicans to get on board, there can't, there can't be um, keeping of revenue or growing of government. And I, I just think that that needs to happen. We, we can't just have more Democratic sponsored bills with no Republicans on board. It makes no sense. Thank you. May Booby, it's true that a lot of the politicians who want to solve climate see revenue streams to fund their favorite projects to address the problem and address environmental injustice. It's happening in California. There's lots of money flowing. Uh, but are you willing to give up that possibility of revenue for a revenue neutral where it doesn't grow government? I guess I want to flip the conversation a little bit and focus on how do we have enough political power to get the legislation we actually need? And like that's what our work is. We don't really do that much work in Washington. We try to build movements so that we can actually demand what we need. And we're so far away from that right now. 
But the fight over the Keystone Pipeline, that wasn't really a policy fight. That was a fight about building power. It was about getting the president to acknowledge that you cannot expand fossil fuel infrastructure. And when Obama made that decision, no other head of state had ever made a decision to cancel a major piece of infrastructure because of climate change. And that was because our movement was powerful. I bet a lot of people in this room got arrested over the Keystone fight or visited Obama at a campaign rally. So, so that is what we work on. And we don't pretend to be every part of the climate movement. I mean, we're the mobilizers, right? That, that's what we help to contribute. And thank goodness for Citizens Climate Lobby and the groups that work on policy and try to build those coalitions because we need everybody doing this. So that, that's what I would say, that we are, and we came close in the last election. I mean, we really did. <laughs> we don't need to relitigate the past, but we're not as far away from building the power that we need, but we certainly haven't been able to demand the kind of action. But to close on a positive note, uh, you mentioned the piece of legislation introduced by Sanders and Merkley this week, 100% renewable energy. That's, what we, that's the new call to action. It's not going to pass tomorrow. It's not going to pass in this Congress. But we're starting to set the markers for what we want. And I think there's an appetite in this country for the kind of leaders who speak to what we really need and not the kind of middle measure that we think that we can get. And 100 percent renewable power is on the table in California as well. I'm Greg Dalton. If you're just joining us, this is Climate One from the nation's capital today. Let's go to our next audience question. Hello, folks. My name is Graham Power. I'm here today from uh, the New Jersey shore. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about, or I should say, you did, about the role of fear in Congress and uh, how it's kind of created a gridlock. And that kind of got me thinking, I'm sorry if this is a little bit of an abstract question. That's more directed at May, but Debbie would love to hear from you as well. Um, how much has fear played in, you know, this grassroots uh, you know, movement that's come about? Where do you see it going? How much more do we need to push it forward? May Booby. There's a lot of fear. How many people in this room feel despair about the climate crisis? Everyone's raising their hands. Um, yeah, everyone's raising their hands. So I, I think there's no way of talking about this issue without acknowledging that. And people are looking at something very scary. Also, different people are motivated by different things. Some people who are active in this movement are really motivated because they want to fight, because they're afraid. Other people are really motivated because they're seeing the vision and they want to reach for that. And so I think everybody needs a little bit of both. And we're all human beings. You know, We wake up one morning feeling great, and some days we feel terrible. So I think acknowledging that um, we all deal with that. I think the question isn't how much more fear do we need, but how do we help people have the resilience to keep doing their work when they're afraid for the outcome. And I think that that's, that's why marches matter, because you're reminded you're not alone. You're reminded you're among all of these people who you never, I mean, I was walking around the march today, I didn't recognize more than five people, you know? So that's wonderful. So that makes me feel less afraid. I hope it made other people feel less afraid. Um, but that's, I don't think that's gonna go anywhere. And it's about, yeah, it's about resilience, and it's about, for many people who are joining this fight for the first time, what, are, what is the future we're trying to build, this 100% renewable idea that we're all so captivated by? Let's go to our next question in Climate One. Welcome. Hi. A fantastic panel. Um, I'm a West Coast liberal, of course, but I think I've seen the future of the climate conversation, and I think she's wearing a green jacket. I really appreciate yes. your... <laughs> comment Thank you. Uh, and you too uh, this conversation <laughs> is great but we already know I'm already with you but this is new uh, what, uh, here's the question <clears throat> President Trump has invited you to the White House each of you he asked each of you a question please tell me one thing that you'd like me to do and one thing you'd like me to stop doing what are your answers Debbie Dooley you're a big supporter of Donald Trump uh, stay in the Paris Accord and start touting the benefits of renew renewables uh, and stop talking about fossil fuel all the time while you admit renewables, the impact with renewables. May Booby. I wouldn't go to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the Obama one. <laughs> 
the White House. Um, so, <laughs> Debbie Dooley, uh, you think that Elon Musk being on the president's uh, uh, council is a good thing. Other people think that uh, that Musk shouldn't be there, that that kind of gives a veneer of, of, uh, of legitimacy to him. But you, why do you think that having people like Elon Musk in the president's circle is effective and a good idea? Because I think it's a very good idea. You don't want uh, the only voices heard to be of... Uh, you know, the fossil fuel industry and, and the coal industry, you want alternative voices out there. And I think some of these voices have had an impact because President Trump promised on day one he would uh, get us out of the Paris Accord. But he's listening to these other voices that have said, you need to stay in it. And I have heard, and I, I'm not a bit surprised that in a lot of those conversations with the renewable energy field, he's trying to talk them into building plants in coal country and put some of the out-of-work coal miners and give them jobs. And I, I just think it's good to have other voices in his administration don't shy away from it. I mean, I did a lot of stuff with, I've done a lot of stuff with progressives and of course, I'm such a shy person, but <laughs> not. But I'm, I'm just saying, I think that is important because he does listen. And with the fact that Elon Musk has been up there multiple times, I think that's very telling. Maybe are there parts or people in the Trump administration you think you can, you can work with? Oh, I, I should clarify my earlier comment. I, I think that there's something about providing legitimacy to administration that we think is causing so many problems. And I, I, I don't think we've really talked about that very much here. He's not just any Republican. He's trying to erode the whole consensus about the role that facts play, that our democracy plays. He insults people. Um, and his, just leaving aside the policy points for a second, but just the way he is using power. And so I don't, I'm not comfortable standing for that. And I, I know there's a, a large portion of our movement that is united there, that we actually have to resist the legitimacy of the administration. And so I think there are a number of people also who he's working with who prop that up, Rex Tillerson foremost among them. Um, there are certainly people that he's brought in who have been very important in our, I mean, Musk is, Tesla is an extremely important company, what they're trying to do, and revolutionizing battery storage. We need that for renewables to take off. I will not deny that for one second, but I think this, this, isn't, any other, this isn't any old political battle that we're in. I wish, I wish it was, but I don't think that's the moment that we're in. We have to wrap it up. We've been talking about the changing politics of climate change. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guests today were May Bovey, Executive Director of the Environmental Group 350.org, and Debbie Dooley, President of Conservatives for Energy Freedom and a co-founder of the Tea Party Movement. We also heard from U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island. We recorded this show at the Museum in Washington, D.C. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows recorded with a live audience are available wherever you podcast. When you download one, please leave a comment and give us a rating. We want to know what you think of our conversations about energy, food, water, technology, psychology, and everything climate. Climate One is the sustainability project of the Commonwealth Club of California. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody.